ticket, guys. We want to encourage you to sign up for community groups. Uh, I think it means Sunday school classes. Well, uh, some may call them that, but they're really just small groups that meet. That is true. Mm -hmm. That is true. I heard of a church one time that called them life groups. Oh, oh um, I have a friend that calls them connect groups. Well, my aunt's church actually calls them cell groups. Okay, okay. My, my brother's cousin, once removed, no, no, twice removed, he calls them growth groups. Well, I heard that the guy who invented Toaster Strudel, his church calls them family groups. Oh yeah? Well, I was watching YouTube once, and this, um, this dachshund was barking, and the dog that was barking made the sound, and the sound that it made sounded like the dog was saying home groups. No. Yes. No. Yes. Show me. Tr Show what? me what it looks like. Was the dog named Bill Cosby? Huh? That sounded no, just it like a dog. Oh. It sounded like a dachshund watching pudding. YouTube. It sounded like a dachshund watching two YouTube. Here in home groups. Anyway, no matter what you call it, sign up. Yeah, there's nothing better than being a part of community and doing life together at church. How many churches call these groups food groups? I don't know, but if I was in a food group, I'd want to be in chocolate. It's not a food group. Yeah, and these aren't all Sunday school classes. <laughs> Great to see you. Glad you're here. Glad you came to worship the Lord together. Uh, we actually started last week in this uh, series. The, the video still says we're going to start it next week, but we got started. And uh, we're in the middle of a series called Balancing Act. We're, we're talking about balancing the different aspects of our life. Uh, home, uh, home life, uh, church life, our job our community and all of that sort of stuff. So last week was kind of an intro to the concept of balance. And uh, this week we're going to talk about having a balanced home or balance in our family. So if you would join me in prayer, I'd be grateful. Oh Lord, we've come to worship you today and you only. And Lord, I know as I stand here and bring this word that I'm really a nobody. Oh Lord, you are the door. You are the good shepherd. You are the way, the truth, and the life. You're the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You are our Lord. You are all in all. And if you will come and speak to us today, Lord, we will hear what is needful in our life. I pray that you come by your Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit who resides in my heart and in those who know you. I pray that you would come and speak to us, that you give us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say to us today. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Matthew 22, beginning in verse 36. Uh, people were talking to Jesus. And they said, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This is kind of the hub of what we're going to talk about over the, uh, the next few weeks. This is a picture I submit to you of living in balance. When you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and you love your neighbor as yourself, you're living in balance. So I picture it kind of like a ceiling fan. Okay, and the ceiling fan, if, if, I'm sure you have them in your house, and if not, you've seen them. they got different blades going out there, right? You take one off, the thing kind of wobbles. It doesn't do very well, okay? Or if you put a weight on one, it'll wobble. Uh, but if you make them all, each one needs to be balanced in itself, and then it needs to be balanced with the others. And that's what we're going to be talking about. So each week as we talk about the, uh, the unit we're talking about, we'll talk about how to have balance within that, and then we'll talk about how that fits into the whole to make us have balance on the whole around the hub of this concept of loving God with all your heart and loving your neighbor as yourself. 
that make enough sense? Yeah. To start with. Okay, let's talk about our family. What, what are we talking about when we say family? Let me tell you what I'm talking about. Because there's different ways it can be defined or whatever. What I'm talking about is who lives in your house. Okay? That can be just yourself. You are your family. And I know you got extended family. And all of that matters. And we'll talk about that from uh, some other time. But I'm really talking today about how to have balance with whoever it is that lives in your house. And we're going to talk about how to have a, uh, a balanced single life, how to have a balanced life with your spouse if you're married, and have a balanced life with your children if God's blessed you with them. Okay, so we're going to talk about those three things as God will allow us to do. That's who we're talking about. Your home, your home is the base from which you live life. Your job is not your base from which you live life. Or at least it ain't supposed to be. If it is, you're messed up. <laughs> Excuse me, you're out of balance. <laughs> Your church is not the base from which you do life. Hopefully it will help you do life, but it is not your base. The family was what God instituted from the very beginning to, to be that base from which we live and work. And we go back home to get energized or to get uh, uh, built up or whatever it is. So that's, that's how we're going to try to attack this thing. So let's talk first about single. Because I want to say... It, we got the singles here, and I don't want to leave you out. We're talking about family, obviously. You're, you have family. You are family to us. And let's talk about what, how can we eat. One of these points I'm going to talk about. I'm talking about a couple of things where we get out of balance. Believe me, in 30 minutes, I'm not going to cover everything there is to talk about in a balanced home, okay? I can't get that fast. I'm from Kentucky, okay? <laughs> so, but what I'm going to talk about is a couple of ways that are common in our culture where we get out of whack. Where we get out of balance. So let's talk about, about singles. You may be single because you haven't ever married. You may be single because you've gone through a divorce. You may be single because you're widowed. Or whatever. But if you find yourself in this single position, I want to talk about a couple of ways that we sometimes get out of whack. And I want to encourage you to get that back in line. The first way is that we're often discontent. How I many of us know somebody, don't raise your hand please. How I many of us know somebody that all they think about is who they want to marry? Did you know that if that's all you were thinking about, that, that uh, obtaining a spouse, if that's driving your life, that's idolatry. Because nothing should, God is the one who is our all in all. Not that spouse that you're looking for. And when you finally find that spouse, you're going to find that out. That they that all in all. <laughs> Well, let me read a scripture to you out of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. But I want, you, uh, I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. That's very true. There is a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord, that she may be holy, both in body and in spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And I'm hoping that's true. And this I say for your own profit, not that I may put a leash on you, but for what is proper that you may serve the Lord without distraction. If you find yourself in a single situation, thank the Lord that you have opportunity to serve Him without some of the distractions that the rest of us who are married or those who are married have. You have an advantage there. Take advantage of the good part. I understand it's okay if you want to get married. That's not a bad thing. That's a normal thing. If that's your desire, fine. I want to give you the three pieces of advice I give people when they come see me and say, oh, I want to get married. And I say, okay, I have three things I want to tell you. This is not a joke. This is true. Okay? Everybody's looking at me. One, know what you're looking for. You need to, if you're, if you're single and, and aspire to be married, you should take this down. Know what you're looking for. In a, in a person that you want to get married to. Probably should write it down. And if it doesn't start with being a, a on fire Christian, then change your list and put that at the top, okay? But you need to have a list. You need to know what you're looking for because if you aim at nothing, that's what you'll hit. Nothing. And a whole lot of people have hit nothing. In this regard. So know what you're looking for. Secondly, become the person that that person would want to marry. Okay, so now we're turning the focus back where it needs to be on who, who we will become. And third, go to where that person is likely to be. That person, if you've got a good list, you're probably not going to find at the bar. That's not the place to go find them. Okay, they're going to be hopefully in church. If you made out a good list, that's probably the best place you can find them. <laughs> and, uh, 
Um, so that, that would be my first. Be content with where we are and be uh, intentional about where we may want to go with the Lord. This is a good thing. Godliness with contentment is great gain, the scripture says. So be content in the situation you find yourself in. Be that single or married or with kids or without kids or whatever. A second uh, disconnect that I see sometimes uh, with people who are single is they live in uh, fear or hatred. Now, this generally grows out of some kind of abuse or neglect or some kind of wrongdoing at some point. If you're in that boat, let me say, I'm, I'm truly sorry that whatever happened, happened. I mean that. I'm not, I'm not patronizing. I mean that. That's a bad thing. We, we're seeing uh, a lot in our culture these days that's coming to light that in times past has been swept under the rug. Let me say I'm glad for the most part that it's coming to light because it's not good. We need to address the abuse. We need to address the, the ungodly behaviors. And we as Christians need to not sweep things like that under the rug. Amen. That's not okay. All right. And we need to be compassionate to those who have, done, who have experienced that. But let me tell you, hate and fear are not of God. And if you uh, have a fear of men if you're a woman or women if you're a man or if you have anger towards them or whatever, that's not God. He wants to set you free from that. He will set you free from that if you'll let him. So while you're in this single state, address that. You've got more time to do it because you're not having to tend to a spouse. Take the time, address that, and let God put you back in balance in your life so that you can walk out your calling. Let me, uh, let me address this in 1 Thessalonians 4. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter. Because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. Let me say something very emphatically. I'm not trying to be mean. But it's God who says. It's not just me. Uh, you might think, Boston's just a prude. I am a prude. <laughs> I'm a proud prude. But that's not why you should behave yourself. If you're single, I get asked this from time to time, is it really not okay to, you know, become too physical intimately? If I'm single, I mean, I'm not married. I get asked this a lot, y'all. This is not uncommon because our culture has this question. And I'm not blaming the culture, I'm blaming us. Okay, we should be answering this question for our culture. It says here that if you engage in sexual immorality, and I'm talking to you singles right now, primarily, obviously I'm talking to you married too, don't do that, but, but even to you singles who might not understand this, understand it says that you defraud your brother or your sister when you do that. Don't do that. Okay? Uh, don't defraud your sister or your brother by engaging what is supposed to be reserved for marriage outside of marriage. Don't do it. It's not okay. And it's not me that's saying it. It's God. Okay? Everybody okay with that? Yes. Let's agree with him. All right. Enough of you singles. I don't want to beat you up all day. <coughs> but, no, I need to say one other thing. If you're in that place where you're afraid or you're angry, please forgive. Forgive. Not for their sake. Whoever abused you, whoever did you wrong, doesn't deserve your forgiveness. Okay? They deserve it something much worse than that. But you need to forgive because God has forgiven you. That's right. And it's for your good. Let it go. I, I've seen that, but I don't know how. Let it go. Okay. What about if we're married? Okay, let's move on to that because there's a few of us in here that are. Uh, if Patty and I live a little while longer, we'll, we'll meet 40 years. And we still like each other. So imagine that. Or at least I like her. The purpose of marriage, let me tell you something, this comes as a shock to some people. The purpose of marriage, it wasn't set up by God to make you happy. It was set up by God to make you holy. It can also make you happy if you'll get in balance here. There's a lot of joy in being married. But let me tell you, there's a lot of work. 
<laughs> and I'm in trouble. Because you can't put two people who are as different as you're going to be together. One's a man, one's a woman. You don't need any more than that to make some sparks, okay? <laughs> You were raised in different homes, you have different personalities, you've been taught different things, and you put together in the small space called a house, and fireworks start sometimes. <laughs> That's, it's impossible that that would not happen some. I understand that, okay? There's a whole teaching we need to do on how to deal with that, which we're not going to get to this morning. But I understand that, that it's easy enough to get out of balance. But can I tell you, a good marriage is not rocket science. It's not hard to understand how to have a good marriage because the Bible po points it out pretty well. What's difficult is forcing ourselves to do what God said. It's our disobedience that leads us in the wrong place. Okay? It's, it's as simple as that. So how do we get out of balance? Let's talk about a couple of things there. One is where one spouse tries to dominate the other. Our objective is oneness. That's what we've been called to is to become one. I, I should give that to you in scripture, obviously, because that's where we uh, quote. But I'm, I'm going to read it to you out of Ephesians. Uh, but this is a quote from Genesis 3. Whenever Jesus talked about marriage, he quoted this verse out of Genesis 2. I'm sorry, it's Genesis 2. And whenever Paul talked about it, which I'm fixing to read, he quoted this scripture. So it's pretty important. If it's, in, if it's Moses said it, Jesus said it, and Paul said it, I think I'll say it. <laughs> Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 31, says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Okay, the picture here is that God desires for our church, the church of Jesus everywhere, he desires for us to be one with him. Now, we fail on that sometimes, don't we? Yes, you can say yes. You won't hurt my feelings. We do. We fail on that. In the same way we fail in our marriage in becoming one. But he's called us to become one. That's not just talking about physically. It does relate to that. I understand that. But it's not just that. Because you can become one with somebody you never... I mean, physically you can be joined with somebody that you don't become one with. It's talking about the joining together of our lives. Okay? And we've been called to do that. And one of the problems... You remember when Adam and Eve sinned? And God pronounced the consequences of their sin, curses. Some will say it's not curses, it's consequences. I don't care. He, he said this stuff anyway. And he said to Eve, he said uh, uh, to her, you'll have pain in childbearing. Okay, we all get that. I've been there for five of my children born, and I wouldn't want to do it. Okay? <laughs> Hats off, and then you did good. <laughs> He also said, your desire shall be for your husband, but he will rule over you. Now that sounds nice. Oh, she's going to like him. He ain't going to like her. Good for you girls. That isn't what that means. What it means is, and if I had the time, I could show you this in scripture, but it means your desire will be to rule over your husband, but he's going to rule over you. In other words, you're going to be butt heads. That's what it means. And it is your, it's your desire to usurp his authority but he's going to somehow put you under his thumb. And there is this constant battle that we have. If we're not walking in the spirit, if we're walking in the flesh, the constant battle is the, the wife is trying to finagle through whatever manipulative means she can come up with to get her husband to do what she wants. And he's trying to put her in her place. And it's war. I'll tell you, it'll not be that way. God's called us to a better way than that. And that better way is oneness. Where we appreciate and embrace the design differences that we have in Christ and we mesh those two into a unity and you don't you don't dominate yourself right can you dominate yourself because you're dominant or whatever then you got to have two to have dominance and so when you become one that whole idea of I'm going to have my way you or I'm going to have my way that goes away to we're going to have God's way in our life as we become one together this is what we're called to y'all and if we're going to have a balanced home, we must appreciate that. Do you know if your spouse was just like you, your footprint in this world would be narrowed to what your, own, your footprint could be by yourself. To broaden your impact in the kingdom, in the community, in, the, uh, in your family, and whatever, to broaden that, you need to appreciate the, the, the strengths of each of you and broaden that uh, footprint, as it were, of your life. So this, this idea of spousal dominance 
is not of God, but oneness is. It's also scripture in 1 Peter 3 says, Husbands likewise dwell with them, meaning your wives, with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, oftentimes, ladies take offense at that as to the weaker vessel. But understand, he says give honor as to the weaker vessel. He didn't say give scorn or look down your nose or disregard them because they're a weaker vessel. And I've used this illustration before. Most of you weren't here and the rest of you forgot it. So I'll say it again. If I had in my hand here a sledgehammer in this hand and a china teacup in this hand, you wouldn't have to have IQ much above plant life to know which one's stronger. Okay? That, that sledgehammer is more powerful than that china teacup. But you can't drink tea out of it. They're designed differently, and this one's weaker, but it is precious in its function. Do you understand me? Okay, this is what he's saying here. Dwell with your wife. He's giving instruction to husband there. Dwell with your wife in an understanding manner. But the real point I want to make here is being heirs together of the grace of life. They are not, as Archie Bunker put it, a cheaper cut. That's not, you know, I think Archie, uh, why would I quote Archie? <laughs> He has not made ladies to be trampled underfoot by some cloth. Quit it. Quit it. And quit trying to be dominant. And ladies, I'm not dodging you. Quit what you're doing too if you're trying to dominate your husband. If you're trying to make sure he does right. You remember the scripture that, that says if, uh, if you're married to an unbeliever, he's talking to ladies in this particular scripture, that... Uh, to, to be quiet. That you might win your husband even without a word as he observes your chaste behavior. Behave in such a way, I, I, I could tell you an actual example, none of you know it's in South Carolina, there, there was this lady, her husband was an unbeliever, and she read this scripture and she had not practiced, practiced it. She already had teenage kids and was the biggest nag you ever saw. And she read this scripture or heard it preached or something, she said, I think I'm just going to try that. And she began to be kind to her husband, who didn't deserve it. Okay, he was a bum. She began to be kind. About two weeks went by and he asked her, he said, you having an affair on me? <laughs> Seriously, that's what happened. You having an affair on me? She said, why in the world would you think that? You're being nice to me and I don't understand this. It got his attention. Let me tell you, ladies, and, and men, it could apply to you too. It's, it's a different application. But let me tell you, you can accomplish great things by walking as Christ wants you to. If you will walk in the Spirit, you will have an impact on everybody, but especially on your spouse. Okay? And that's what we're called to do. Y'all got that? Second problem. Second problem is not as common as that. Let me tell you, the, the spousal dominance is a very common problem in our culture. And make sure you understand what I'm saying. When I'm talking about our culture, I'm not trying to badmouth the culture. I'm trying to say that that's the result of us not doing our job. Right. Okay? So let's look back at where it can be. I might have said that already, but it needed to be said twice. So. Second problem that I see is, is marriages where you're basically roommates and business partners. You're, you're fortunate in that you have two incomes or an income and somebody watching after the income or however you do it. And you live in the same house because it's cheaper to do that, but you don't care a whip smidgen about each other. Let me tell you, that stinks. That stinks. God's called us to better than that. And I, I've known uh, I've known couples or I've known of other couples who live in the same house as if it was two apartments. They're they're totally separate. Never the twain shall meet. Okay? They don't uh, they don't eat together. They don't talk together. They don't sleep together. They don't anything. And let me tell you, that's not healthy, y'all. That's not what God's called you to. And um, so, so we don't want to do that. I just want to read a, a brief scripture here in Romans 16, uh, where Paul's saying uh, to the church at Rome, says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. They're a good example for us. They worked together in the kingdom of God. Now, they had other jobs, too. Okay, but they worked together in what they were doing. They had a common purpose. If you are fortunate enough to be married, some of you are thinking if you're unfortunate enough, but I'm telling you, if you're fortunate, if you're married, if you're fortunate enough to be married, let's work toward having a common, intentional 
uh, application of our life to what we're doing. Let's serve the Lord together as fellow workers. They're mentioned numerous times, six or so times in Scripture, always together. Sometimes Priscilla and Aquila, sometimes Aquila and Priscilla. So, but they're mentioned together because they work together. I shudder to think what my life would be like in the ministry without Patty. Okay? She feels sometimes I push her into too much, and that's probably true. But I, she's that important to me and to what we do. And so uh, this is how we should be walking together. If you're not there, and many of you are not, if you're not there, how about I ask God to help you get there? How about I ask the Lord to show you how you can walk together better? You'll probably have to talk about it, guys. <laughs> Just say Third, let's talk about children. Before I get into that, let me say that we're beginning a parenting class next Sunday night. This is my recruitment speech because Patty and I are going to be teaching it along with um, Steve and Allison Knight as we're going to be training them so they can do it in uh, future dates. Uh, but we're going to talk about that. Uh, if you live as long as we do, you'll learn something if it's by accident. So we're going to share whatever we can share with you uh, starting next week on how to parent. Let me give this caveat before I get into my couple of points here. It is not essential that you handle your family exactly as I handle mine. You're different than me. Your, your wife is different than Pat. God will direct you, but there are principles in His Word that are not negotiable. And those things we need, to, we need to learn and do. And we'll as God will give us guidance, we'll try to explain those things to you. But but don't, if we say it somehow a little different than you think it ought to be, don't throw it all out. Okay? Get what God has to say to you and uh, uh, accept the Word as it is. Okay, the first uh, problem that I will see and that I will point out in our culture, because I think this is big, and it's not just big among non-Christians, it's big among Christians as well. And that is what we call the child-centered home. Let me tell you, right off the bat, that's not good. Children are not equipped to run a house. And we see them running it all the time. And if your kids are running your house, if they're old enough for you to sit down and talk to them, I think you should sit them down and apologize to them for allowing too much responsibility to fall on them. Lay out for them the new program. There's a new sheriff in town. And the person who's responsible in that home is going to take control in the home. Now, that, not, that you don't, don't be mean. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about step up and do what you should do. Uh, in writing about Abraham in, in uh, Genesis, God was saying, this is uh, talking to, uh, to some angels who are going to talk to Abraham. So anyway, Genesis 18, verse 19. For I have known him, Abraham, in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. According to that scripture, part of why God chose Abraham to be the recipient of his covenant through whom the Messiah would come and through whom we all know Jesus today. He's a pretty important guy and he was selected at least in part because God knew that he would command his children and his household to follow the Lord. And so they did. And so they did. And so it is with us. If we are, uh, if we are parents and we have children, we are blessed. The scripture says that. Okay? Sometimes we don't feel like that. I understand that. But we are blessed. No children are a, a blessing of the Lord. Blessings the man whose quiver's full. Some people have larger quivers than others. <laughs> but you're blessed if it's full. Okay? And so, um, we get out of balance. Let me tell you something. That really just irks me. If I saw your kid do it, I'm sorry. Don't take offense personally. I hate it when I see kids back back talking and talking ugly to their parents. You know, that doesn't look good. And if your kids do that to you, let me tell you, people looking at you thinking, poor you your kid. You don't like that. I wouldn't like that. And so, uh, when 
And maybe I'll be talking over here to these. <laughs> if you talk back to your parents, and there's other young people in the house besides these, so if I'm talking to them, I'm talking to you too. If you're back talking to your mama and your daddy, that's not okay. That looks awful. It doesn't make you look smart. It doesn't make you look in control. It makes you look out of control and ill behave. That's what I'm just telling you. Okay? Take that from an old guy that sees a lot of it. That's not good. Because the scripture says in uh, Ephesians 6, 1 through 4, it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. We'll get a little more to that in a minute. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. It's the first commandment of promise that you can live a long time. Let me give you another, uh, let me give you another promise. Disobey your parents and dishonor them, and you may not be long for this world. Now, the Bible doesn't have to say that. That's from the BSV, the Boston Standard Version. Okay? I'm just telling you. Of course, I'm kidding. Sort of about that. Okay? But the fact is, life, not just living in your body on this earth, but life as you would have it, the good life that you want, is not found in a disobedient, disrespectful relationship with your parents. Y'all okay with that? Y'all sure are a good looking bunch of young people. <laughs> We should care about what our parents, I mean, what our kids think and feel. I'm not saying disregard them. I'm not advocating children should be seen and not heard. I'm not talking about that. I think they should be engaged with. I think you should know what they feel and know what they think and guide that as a good parent should. That's what I'm calling you forth to do. Don't let your kids run your life. And if they are running it and you don't know how to deal with it, you better be there next Sunday night. Because sometime in that course, we're going to talk about how to deal with that. Because a, a child-centered home is an insecure place to a child. Can you hear me? Structure and guidance brings security to children. And they grow up much better adjusted than if they aren't given that same guidance. And you're quiet on that. <laughs> Second uh, problem I see in, in homes as regards children is the, exo the exact opposite. It's a child neglectful home. We see this on the news sometimes where a child is neglected, whatever. It's a very sad thing. Can I tell you that neglect sometimes is found closer to home than somebody who left their kid in a hot car or didn't feed them for a week or whatever. And those are horrible things. But sometimes we neglect. Let me tell you a statistic I read. I read a statistic that says the average father in America spends 54 seconds a day in direct communication with his child. If that doesn't stab you to the heart, you need to go find your heart. 54 seconds! Why, you can't even say, how's your day going? And I can in 54 seconds. 54 seconds in direct communication. That is horrible, y'all. Do you understand that's horrible? Does everybody in this room understand that's horrible? Because if you don't, we need to have a different discussion. It's not okay to disregard your children. To come into the house, turn on the TV, and pay a teacher debt for hours, and disregard your children is a travesty. It's inexcusable. And we must stop it. I don't care if you have to get rid of your television. That's such a, a huge thing to even imagine. But if you can't spend time with your kid, get rid of the TV. And get rid of their cell phone if you need to. And get rid of their Xbox, if that's what it's called, or whatever. You've got to engage them or they're going to be ruined. Do you love your children? Then take control of this thing. Get engaged in their life. Know what they're doing. Here's a suggestion. 
And, and I know somebody in the room has a situation this won't fit, but most of you this will fit. Start having dinner together. Just make that one time everybody's got to be there, no electronics. Not sitting in front of the television. Patty told Daniel a little while back, Daniel's my son for those who don't know. She told Daniel one day, he said, you know, your dad and I, most of the time for supper, we get TV trays and watch the news or Wheel of Fortune or Jeopardy, depending on what time it is, and eat our dinner. Daniel said, how depressing. <laughs> Let me tell you, when we had children in that house, we sat down to dinner together unless there was some reason we couldn't. Now, I understand maybe you're working second shift. You can't do that. Eat breakfast together. Do something intentional. And while you're there, ask how their day went. Or if it has to be breakfast, ask them how their day's going to go. I heard, I know that you told me yesterday you're going to have a test today. How'd the test go? <coughs> you know, you and Susie made up yet. Yeah, whatever, I don't care. Engage in their life. It's not much to ask you. You're going to eat. So while you eat, just engage with your children. Make a point to do that. I'll, I'll tell you this, because we always ate together. In the house we had in South Carolina, uh, we had windows that you could kind of see our dining room table from the highway. And we lived by an intersection where hunters would gather to go on hunts down there, where they would do a dog drives or man drives or whatever. That's where the group would meet before they go out on their, their deer hunt. And we were good friends with one of the guys who was uh, one of the organizers of the deer hunts. And he told me of a, of a situation that happened one day. Um, he mentioned that he knew us. We're, our house is just across the street from where they're getting. He said, oh, you know them? This other fellow said, you know them? He said, yeah. And the other fellow who never met us, I've not met him to this day, never met this guy. He said, man, they're a good family. Buster said, why do you say that? He said, I see them eating dinner together every night. That was a testimony to him. Don't know him. I hope he's safe. I don't know. But let me tell you, it is important enough that people notice if you do it. Your kids will notice if you do. don't neglect them. Don't neglect them for your job. Don't neglect. Them. I mean, we wouldn't think of neglecting them with food, would we? We're gonna feed our children. We're gonna give them clothes to wear. Maybe not the ones they want, but we're gonna give them something. <laughs> We're not going to neglect their education. We shouldn't neglect their spiritual education either. Nor should we neglect them in terms of discipline. Because if you want discipline in children, the scripture says you hate them. We can have a discussion about what that means, and we will in our class. But let me tell you, the scripture says he who spares the rod hates his child. Hates doesn't say spare the rod, spoil the child. It says if you spare the rod, you hate your child. And we can discuss what all that means and we will. Don't neglect your children. Proverbs 29, 15, as the band starts to come on around to me, says, the rod and rebuke give wisdom. Not one without the other. Don't just wail on your children and hope they'll figure it out. They won't. What they'll figure out is not good. But don't just fuss either. Not do anything that gives them. You know, true guidance. The rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Every time. If you neglect your children, you will regret it. Now, it's more convenient to neglect them sometimes. Well, I know they're doing something bad, but if I have to go in there and deal with it, it's going to take 30 minutes and I don't have it. I need to do my nails. <laughs> It's pay me now or pay me later, y'all. Deal with it. It's difficult at times. Be consistent. Be intentional. I've told this before, but I'm going to tell it again lest you think I'm some kind of mean, awful person. Mm -hmm. Well, you probably will anyway. <laughs> I, when, when we, I think we had two children at this time, so they're little. Charity's probably uh, three and Daniel one. And I was wrestling in my mind with how to raise my children. I was in my early 20s and clueless. And so I was watching other people because if I saw some kids that were well behaved, I thought, well, I'd like to do what that kid's parents do. 
And if I see one that's ill-behaved, I don't want to do what that kid's parents do. So I began to try to watch and pay attention. And let me tell you what I saw. What I saw was some people who were very strict had kids who as soon as they got old enough to ran wild as the hills and ill-behaved. And I saw others who were very strict whose kids grew up and seemed to do right. I was perplexed. And I saw others who seemed to be pretty lax. I, you know, I thought, well, they're letting way too much go on. And their kids grew up, and when they got a little older, they went wild as the hills because they were allowed to do whatever they want. And I saw others who seemed to be <laughs> lax in their family rules or whatever, whose kids grew up and seemed to do all right. And I said, God, I can't fix this thing out. What's up with this? And you know what I found was, was the common denominator? Consistency. Wherever you draw that line, hold that line. You may not draw the same lines I draw. You probably won't. Maybe I should draw the ones you drew or should have. That ship has sailed for me. But wherever you do it, be consistent, be intentional, and, and that will not be neglectful if you will do it that way. Everybody got that? No. So let's see how do we apply that. Hopefully I've been applying it, but where are you? I don't know which of these groups you fall in. Maybe you're single, maybe you're married, maybe you have kids. Whichever it is. Maybe you've got grandkids. There's a, there's a place there as well. But wherever you find yourself in this, are you pursuing God with all of your heart to be the man or woman of God or young person of God? To live out what you should. Are you doing that? If the answer to that is not completely yes, then how about let's seek God and repent. And ask Him to forgive us of our negligence. Or forgive us of our dominance. Or forgive us of our discontent. Or whatever the others are. There were six of them. I just named three, okay? Oh, forget. But whatever it is that God's dealing with you, because He can do that. He can take this one set of words spoken by a hillbilly and he can bring them to you and speak to you in your life and if he's doing that I want you to do what he asks you to do. I want you to repent. I want you to seek him. And if you have never joined the family of God let me invite you. Let me say you can be born again. He can transform you on the inside spiritually and then he can begin to transform your life experientially if you will let him and I invite you to do that. If you don't know Jesus and want to know him, if you come up here today and see me, I will introduce you. You can know Him today. And I ask you to do that. If you need to come to the altar and pray for any reason, our altar is open for your benefit. Please come. Understand this. We know that God can meet you right in that seat and you don't have to move an inch. But sometimes, a lot of times, it does us good to take that step of obedience to come and pray so that we are saying with our body what we're meaning to say in our mind and in our heart. And I want to obey God in this. So let's stand together as the band leads us uh, in worship and you do what God lays on your heart.
that you want my family to be on that foundation. That you love my kids enough and you have a calling on their life and you put them in my responsibility, Father God. So I pray, God, that you would meet every home today, God. God, every home, that there would be unity, Father God, in you. That you would be at the center, Father God. God, I pray God, your word says that the, the youth should not look down. They shouldn't let anybody look down on them because they're young. But they should be that example through your word through what you were calling them to, Father God. So I pray for truth and life and love in our families today. God, I pray for that strength that is you, that is your word, Father God, that we would not neglect it, God, but that it will be the forefront of our hearts, God, as fathers. Lord, I pray that we would stand up, God, and be what you have called us to be, Father God, that we would be attentive to your word, attentive to our children, attentive to our wife, Father God, to the wives, God, that there would be that loving, caring, God, what you have called them to be in the homes, Father God, that they would not neglect it either, Father God. God, that our homes would be strong, that the church would be strong, Father God. God, I praise you today for your word. God, may we receive it in your precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen.